Just ahead on American Black Journal, the landmark ruling that ended racial segregation in public schools was handed down 60 years ago. But how far have we come? We'll talk with Detroit NAACP President Reverend Wendell Anthony. Plus, we'll take a look at a groundbreaking new movie about a mixed race woman fighting slavery in 18th century Britain. Stay with us. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. 60 years ago this month, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal was unconstitutional. The landmark decision set the stage for racial integration in public schools. It was a major victory for the NAACP and the civil rights movement. But today, studies show that segregation is still widespread in our nation's schools. Here to talk about equality in education is the president of the Detroit NAACP, Reverend Wendell Anthony. Welcome back to American Black Journal. Thanks, Stephen. Good to be with you. Yes. I always like to be next to royalty. <laughs> Surprise stop winner. it, stop Steven it. Henderson. <laughs> I always say when you're Lord here, mercy. <laughs> I always say when you're here, we should switch seats. They'll use to host no. this show. You ask the questions, well, right? I'm just, I'm just touching him with your garments. Yeah, so all, all right. No, I, that's you, enough sir. of that. <laughs> so so I, I, I think, I feel like uh, Thurgood Marshall, who yes. argued Brown in front yes. of the court and then went on to become the first black justice on the Supreme Court. I feel feel like if he were here, this would this would not look like what he predicted would happen after that. Not ruling. at all, not at all, Stephen. And and it's important that we recognize it. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Just briefly, the history of that somewhat. Uh, it started with um, a welder, right. a man by the name of Oliver Brown, and he had a third year daughter, Linda, and she was not able to go to school in Topeka, Kansas, seven blocks from where she lived. And as a result of that, he. Uh, filed a lawsuit and it became later on an amalgamation of at least five cases uh, which was focused on education. Thurgood Marshall following Charles Hamilton Houston, um, they used education as a strategy. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education is about more than just education. Right. It's about facilities. It's about uh, equal opportunity in the workplace and jobs and all those kinds of things. Sure. Blacks were not able to use the restaurants in the South. So it was a big, major decision, and this May is the 60th anniversary. Now what we see as a result uh, of separate and unequal and now putting everything equal through their, uh, the, the modality of Brown, we seem to be going back. We seem to be retreating that. The recent case uh, here in Michigan yes. uh, on affirmative action right. uh, is such an indication where the University of Michigan used to have 7.5% uh, uh, of African American students, now it's down to 4 it's point to something. Four. Yeah. They said they were going to do something like 10% in the 60s. I don't think in my understanding they never acquired 6 no. or 10, but you know, Stephen, uh, colleges and universities is the doorway to diversity. Uh, I went to Wayne State University and I was around a lot of white students and students from all over the country and just sharing that culture and them sharing my culture, yeah. understanding the kind of music I listen to, sure. the kind of foods that I like, the kind of parties that we have. So when you shut that down, you minimize the opportunity for people to grow together and to glow together, and that's what we seem to be right now. Yeah. Uh, at the K-12 level, it, it seems that uh, segregated schools reflect segregated housing. No question. Right? No uh, question. Uh, Brown said uh, you can't legally separate, separate uh, people, but what we've done is separated ourselves. Absolutely. I mean, Detroit, Michigan, uh, this region is one of the most segregated areas uh, in the country. However, we seem to be coming back, more whites and other folk are moving back into the community, black folk are moving out, moving out. of the city, and, right. and now we seem to have some synergy where we're trying to stabilize. But I think if people live together and understand who each other is, then possibly uh, we can move beyond the, the bridge and the divide. Uh, affirmative action as a tool to address some of this, yeah. this divide. Uh, equal opportunity as a tool to address some of the divide. Fair housing as a tool. Voting rights as a tool. Uh, it's, it's like 
this, this case was a stone. Now the stone is being chipped away. Yeah. We have photo IDs, which is not what Thurgood and Hamilton Houston and all these other sure. folks worked for. Even in Arkansas, what we're finding now, Stephen, is that with the photo ID laws, you give your driver's license right. Right. and your pictures on it. Now they're asking folk, well, do you live on out of, did your license say out of drive or out of place? Right. <laughs> Does your, the, uh, what is the exact way your name is on the uh, photo ID that you have given me? Uh, what is the exact date? They're given tests right, right. around which, the license, which is not what it's supposed to be. And remind us of the kind of tests that the they used to have. The poll taxes and those the tests. polls for black people. And so sure. what we're saying, we, we, we hope that's not coming to Michigan because if so, we got our eye on you <laughs> because Michigan has a photo ID situation yeah, we here as well. So we're simply saying the stone was set up to help everybody and not to divide anyone. And we seem to be denigrating the legacy of Thurgood Marshall yeah. and all those blacks and whites who worked so hard for us to have equal education, and equal opportunities today. Yeah, uh, let me ask you this question. I mean, there are a lot of people who say that uh, before Brown and we had black schools and yes. we had white schools, yeah. but those black schools were not <laughs> as bad as people uh, have, have said it. Uh, Obviously, we can't go back. I mean, yes. the, the law is the way it right. should be. But is there something to the idea that uh, that we ought to have more of our own in our community to make sure that that you know that kids get educated, whether they're in integrated settings or not? It's nothing wrong with doing that. However, when you say that and suggest that people think you're trying to be divisive sure. and you want yours, and, they, and it's not like that. The quality is what people are after. Right. Uh, and prior to Brown versus Board of Education, we had separate schools, but they were not equal. You didn't have the kind of materials. Right. You didn't have the kind of teaching. It sounds like today, doesn't it? Right. Uh, you didn't have the kind of teaching staff and the commitment that you have. So you have things like the EAA coming in today. And you, and you suggest and you ask, you know, Possibly when we when we didn't have as much, we did much better. Right. Um, that's why the historical black colleges are still are very, still very there. important. Sure. And it's not because they're trying to be divisive, but I always wish that I had had that kind of opportunity. I went to Wayne State University, University of Detroit, and Mary Grove. Right. But I but I understand that it, it it presents a solidarity, a common a common bond. It presents a life situation that bonds students for the rest of their lives, yeah. which you don't get at major institutions. It's not to say that we shouldn't have that, but there's something to say when you have to do something in your own situation, right. it comes better. So I hope that's not where we're going, Stephen. I hope that America as a nation can still understand that being a diverse nation makes you more of a greater it's nation. Stronger, it, sure. It's stronger. Our diversity is our greatness, it's not our weakness. And so many people believe that if you're diverse, you're gonna lose something. No, you gain when you're diverse. You gain the beauty of the black experience. You gain the beauty of what Europeans have brought. You gain right. what Asians have done. You gain what Middle Easterners bring to the table. You gain what Africans, so I'm saying, you just, you gain, you don't lose, and so, Many of us think that if you get some, I lose I some. Get, I lose. No. Yeah. If you get some and I got some, we both got some. <laughs> right. So everybody's happy. Right, right. Uh, I, I've got you here. I, I've got to ask you about Detroit uh, schools, which, yes. which we haven't really talked that much about <laughs> in, the, in recent years. I mean, it oh. seems like uh, uh, for a while there was sort of an urgency to say, something's got to be done. The, the, the system is, is failing. Uh, kids are leaving it. Uh, we, we got an emergency manager yeah. in, I think, 2008 or nine. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have an emergency manager. Things are not better by You're still almost seem any to be manager. in an emergency. And, and now they've taken the EAA schools, you know, 15 schools yes. out and said, this is going to be a recovery district. That doesn't seem to be going the way. Uh, and that I've heard predicted. that there's some, even some thought to giving them to the mayor. Uh, right. And come on, so Steve, what are we supposed to do? But what road. are we going to do? I think that we need to prioritize seriously education. Education begins in the home and in the community. Right. If I fix all the Detroit public schools today, and I go back to the same community at the end of the day, uh, I have not, not fixed them. Yeah, that's right. If I fix my community and I don't fix the schools, then I have not done it. You got to do a holistic approach. Yeah. You got to bring uh, parents, 
committed. You've got to bring jobs and resources. You've got to bring a focus. You've got to realistically fund them. You've got to hold staff accountable. It begins with the leadership at the schools. And we need to emphasize teaching right. as opposed to just testing. testing yeah, right. And so many of us are trying to test our way into higher education as opposed to teaching our way to get to a higher education. So I think there's a lot of room for some analysis and some critique, but right now what's not working, and I look at my own child, we have a three-year-old daughter, check that out, I'm still good, Steve. <laughs> we have a three-year-old daughter, and I often ask myself, she's in school right now, yeah. and I ask myself, and that is really on her mother, where is she going to go? She should be able to go right down she the street. She should be able to go around the corner. That's right. But, but she, but she ain't Not going right city. around the corner. No, no. She's going to go where we know she can get the best educate, better than what her daddy got. Now, right. daddy got a pretty good right. education. I went to Central High School. Yeah. I ain't mad at it. Right. But, but Central is different today. Sure. And I'm simply saying that this is you the don't issue have that of our choice. time. That's right. You do not have the same choice no. as somebody who lives out in farm. I do not. And I don't have that choice either. You know, I live in the city, and uh, you can't send your kid right. just to But I want school. the choice, Stephen. Yeah. I want these children so to who have should the who should be governing our schools i mean uh, this is the question we always seem to be get, get hung up on when we govern them locally they were not they still were not good but schools. but but the state is governing them and the state's governing them and they're still not good <laughs> so, so that maybe maybe what we need is a combination of the two yeah. maybe everybody needs to get be a part of it but i do think that when you take it away from the people and they have no say in it, they have no stake in right. it. And, that's and not, so yeah. that's not what's happening. Yeah. So we know what's not working. Maybe we, if we sit down at a common table and if we are honest and we say, I have, my only interest in this is to educate children, then maybe we can work out a formula that works for everybody. Right. But it begins with community having strong input in the education of their children. Yeah, uh, getting back to the, the Brown decision and, and sort of where we are, uh, segregation is is by choice now. I mean, we had yeah. de jure segregation. Now yeah. we have de facto uh -huh. segregation because people don't want to live with people who don't look like them. And you still have tremendous racism mm -hmm. that, that prevents blacks from having opportunities right. to live places. We don't live that, in a post-racial society. We do not live in a post-racial society. Yeah. So what's the next What's the next step? What's the next uh, uh, battle in that, that long-term struggle to get to equality that we need to be focused on? I think Justice so Sonia Sotomayor said it well in her dissent yeah, against right. uh, in the uh, affirmative, action, affirmative case. action case when she said, you cannot wish this stuff away. Right. You got to engage it, you got to discuss it, and you got to confront it. Right. I think unless all of us are involved in the engagement and the confronting and the discussing of it, it's not going to go away. I have white folk who live in my community. I live in North Rosedale Park. They've been living there for the last. And that's an integrated, years. Uh, integrated community. community. Sure. I see more whites coming to Midtown and all over town because you can get good houses at a cheap price. Right. So I see folk coming back to the community. I believe that we should replenish our community, not knock down all the homes, but put people in the homes. Let them renovate them. And I'm glad that the mayor understands that, that. Sure. and he believes that. So I'm saying that <clears throat> that's the way to reintegrate people into our communities. I think we have to have honest discussions. I think that our world is becoming more, more consolidated and closed. It's not like when you say a global community, it's not, don't take me that long to get to you now. Right. So I think we're becoming, if global warming is gonna make us get together <laughs> because of the way the world is going. Yeah. So I think, I think Stephen, even with all this mess that's going on, I'm still optimistic. I'm not pessimistic. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot different today than I was 20, 30 years ago yeah. when I was sitting here <laughs> doing what you were doing. But I, I see, I try to look for the best in all people. I try to see what you have that's, that's of value so I can use it. Right. And you use what I have that's, we don't, may not always agree, but there are some things that we can right. agree that we can on. Work on and if we can start on things that we agree on and solidify that, then the rest of the stuff should be easier. Yeah. All right. Well, always good to see you. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, Mr. Pulitzer you. Prize Yes, winner. thank you very much. All I appreciate right. that. We'll see you soon. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Just ahead on American Black Journal, we'll talk about a new movie that tells a true story of race relations during slavery. That's next, right after our look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African-American life in Detroit. 
This week in 1976, Love Hangover by Diana Ross was the nation's number one song. In 1987, the National Museum of the Tuskegee Airmen opened at historic Fort Wayne. And in 1897, the Phyllis Wheatley Women's Club, an organization of African-American women, was formed at Second Baptist Church. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African-American Life in Detroit. The new movie, Belle, tells the little-known true story of a mixed-race woman born into the British upper class during the 1700s. The title character is the illegitimate daughter of a slave and a white admiral in the Royal Navy. Although she's an heiress, she still must deal with racism and inequality. Here's a clip. I don't, my dear. Papa! Good Lord, the Negro. She really is... A lady. Capital. I have no idea she'd be so black. Did you not listen to the rumors when you were spreading them, Mama? May I present the second of my two nieces? Miss Dido Lindsay. A pleasure, Miss Lindsay. Joining me now to talk about this historic movie is Professor Lisa Alexander from the Department of Africana Studies at Wayne State University. Welcome to Thank American Black Journal. Thank you for inviting me. Boy, that, that scene where she says, I had no idea she would be so black. black. Yes. <laughs> so that's, you know, stunning. Oh my gosh. Uh, that looks like it looks like a really good good movie. It but is it's a good also movie. a story that's much more common, I feel like, in our history than most people are willing or ready to acknowledge. Yes, I mean, there were a lot of mixed race relationships. One of the reasons why we have a very diverse looking population uh, uh, right, right. around the world. And so it should not really come as a great shock to people that there are, there were mixed race relationships. Right, right. So, so tell me about this particular story. This is a, a slave and uh, 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 an admiral in the Royal Navy who had uh, a relationship. Yes, and a, a produced a daughter, uh, and the admiral wanted uh, his daughter to have all of the uh, privileges that she was entitled to based on his rank, right. uh, and asked his aunt and uncle to raise her uh, as they would their own, own children, uh, and they did that, and she was raised in a household of great uh, privilege. Yeah, right, right, which was unusual. I yes. mean, mostly uh, these kind of relationships then the, the the offspring were kept out of right. out of that society. So so what what uh, what sort of effect did that have? I mean, on white society, but then also on this this African American woman who's sort of alone, really, in that world. Well, it was really interesting because of her class status. She had this wonderful privilege that other black women at the time did not have. did not have. Right. Uh, but that that class privilege didn't protect her from the racism and the sexism that were inherent at the time. So we see the, uh, the main character kind of trying to figure out how to navigate, okay, I have this money, I have this privilege, but as we saw in the clip, there are still people who are going to treat me a certain way because of my skin color, and also this is the 1700s, so I'm right. also going to be treated a certain way because I am a woman. Right, uh, And trying right. to deal with the intersections of all of those that identities. That gender uh, difference is, is, of course, pronounced, and some people say is, is as pronounced as racial differences at that point. Yes, and in the film, it's interesting, uh, the title character has a, a white uh, cousin who does not have the same economic privilege that she does. So her white cousin is forced to marry uh, into a wealthy family where uh, our title character has money and can marry for love if she chooses to. Right, right. Uh, but because of her race, she's not able to navigate kind of the courting process in I the see. same way because the suitors that she might attract might not, as we saw, uh, want to deal with her because of her race. Because of her race, right. Uh, I mean, this is a story that's set in the 1700s, uh, but th there are themes uh, in in this story that we see play out today. Yes, class privilege may, is probably not going to protect you from racism right. and sexism. <laughs> right. uh, we know this today, and our title character learns that throughout the course of the film. Yeah. And really experiences a political awakening because of the backdrop of the story is a slavery case that her uncle is trying to uh, adjudicate. And so she really learns about what slavery is about, uh, yeah. which she has been sheltered from uh, due to her class privilege. And she really starts to understand, hey, if other black women can be treated as property, you know, 
what's going to what happen to me? What does this mean for me? me? Sure. Uh, and she really does tr uh, try to find ways to figure that out and to make sure that other people can uh, experience the same privileges that she has been given. Right. Yeah, the, the main character here, in some ways, reminds me of President Obama in the sense of uh, someone who's been, uh, you know, put into a position that's not like any other right. African American has, but, uh, and it's a powerful position, but still has to deal with the limitations of race. I mean, you think of how often uh, uh, race defines the interactions people have with President Obama. I mean, I, I, I am constantly talking about the, the sort of disrespect yes. that he's shown uh, by even by the press corps uh, sometimes uh, that I don't think would, would happen if he were white. I, I, the, the character here is sort of is in the same situation. But she has the added gender uh, And she's got the issue uh, another well. issue, so right, another dynamic. Figure, uh, and at that making time, that worse. Yeah, right. women were basically second class citizens as well and you add race on top of that, you know, she's a third and fourth class citizen. Right. Uh, but her money, you know, get, affords her a little bit of protection from that. Uh, and so it isn't until she's much older at least as portrayed in the film that she understands, you know, what racism and sexism is. Right. Uh, and which is not something that I think uh, President Obama he's had not, to do. He, he's he, not he figured that out. Yeah, that, he figured right? that out long before right. our title character did. Right. Yeah. Um, when we talk about stories like this, I mean, it also reminded me of uh, Thomas Jefferson and it's the Sally Hemings, Hemings uh, yes. family, and that the struggle that we still have over that. I mean, that still seems to make people very uncomfortable yes. uh, for a number of reasons, and and some of them are are I think very justified. One is this relationship between uh, uh, slave owners and slaves. That it, it can be, I suppose, romantic, but it's not consensual, right? right. I mean, uh, you can't uh, consent if you are not free. Right. Uh, if you're not even seen as a human being. not even seen as a human being, you're seen as property. Uh, you know, those kind of things still really, really bother us. And we're not, we're not comfortable talking about them, and particularly talking about them in terms of the powerful people who who helped create this country. Right, we have this tendency, and I don't know if this is a tendency in the United States or a human tendency, we try to erase the flaws of our heroes. <laughs> right, uh, right, and so we they have could to, not have done that, right? <laughs> right, we have to acknowledge that Thomas Jefferson, you know, did some great things, you know, we live in the United States, the country is, is, is good, if, <laughs> if problematic, but we also have to acknowledge that there was some problematic issues going on, in the fact that he owned uh, human beings. Right. He did not necessarily see them as human, but if you read his notes on the state of, uh, of Virginia, he says, you know, if there is a just God, there is no way he's going to take our side to take on this our issue. Side, right. uh, and so he did understand that right. what he was doing was I mean, he was, was wrong. deeply conflicted. Yes. And I think the relationship with Sally Hemings really illustrates that. He <laughs> obviously saw her as human, uh, right. even though he wasn't treating her that way. Right, and in the relationship in the film between uh, Lord Mansfield, uh, the uncle, and, and uh, Dido was very much this idea that he he loved her deeply, and but he understood what problems she would have in society given her race and her gender. And like uh, you guys were discussing in the previous segment, this idea that we don't know if he would have decided on the slavery cases the way that he did if he had not been exposed to the fact that he was raising a black woman, right. you know, in the society. So having that intimate connection with people that are different from you That's right. changes your point it, of view. It gives you that other a broader perspective. perspective. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, th this film, uh, uh, you, you hope that people will will go and see it, yeah. but but it, it seems like we don't get enough stories like this uh, no, we don't. In, in popular media. Yeah, particularly where black women are at the center uh, of the conversation and uh, Bell Hooks in her conversation with uh, Melissa Harris Perry a few months ago talked about the fact that usually if we see tales of black women, they're battered and beaten. Uh, sure. Uh, and, and that is so not they're the case. They're in distress in some way. And yeah. that is not what this film is about. And so it is a refreshing change of pace for the way that black women right, right. are and portrayed. The, the complex dynamic there where she's not uh, battered or, or downtrodden but that she still is marginalized right. uh, because of the, 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 the restrictions in the society where she lives. Right, and there's no white savior in this film. She is the heroine <laughs> of the her heroine, own right. story. That's she figures unusual. out you know, what she needs to know about the case and takes you know, her future into her own hands, yeah. uh, which is also a great change of pace for people of color in general in right. Hollywood. Right. Uh, if you uh, you're teaching at uh, at Wayne, how often do these kind of themes come up 
do you feel like even in, on college campuses and in the curriculum? Well, in the classroom it does, but that's mostly because I teach a class on black right. milk. <laughs> right, there you <laughs> and go. So, those, those so discussions you can have, bring it up, right? I can bring it up. It comes up all the time from the films of Oscar Micheaux to the films of Spike Lee to the films of uh, Ava DuVernay. You know, these issues come up in how people of color are portrayed in Hollywood and yeah. the types of stories that Hollywood uh, wants to portray. Uh, the director of Bell, who is a black British woman, is now directing a Hollywood film. Uh, so we will see if, you know, if that there's more, begins yeah. to progress. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Well, great to have you here and uh, people should go see the film. Yes, they should. Thank yeah. you for having me. All right. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll return with new episodes of American Black Journal on Sunday, June 15th at 1230 p.m. Beginning that week, you can also catch the rebroadcast on a new day, Wednesdays at 730 p.m. We hope you'll tune in. We'll see you next time. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.